joined by Dr. Natasha Story. Dr. Natasha Story, my most cultured of guests, librarian at the University of Melbourne. Story by name and story by nature, we love it. So there'll be a lot of opinions today for getting You're... nervous. <laughs> so I've decided there are no stupid questions left. I'm just gonna call in an expert. Breakfast with Sammy J on ABC Radio Melbourne. I never thought I'd be on the radio. It's not something I'd ever dreamed about and I didn't seek it out. But in late 2019, I found myself faced with an opportunity to go on ABC Radio National to talk about a topic I thought I knew very little about. So I said yes. And in doing so, I discovered new ways to connect with audiences outside my university library. And it made me think about how as librarians, we can create impact and engagement beyond traditional measures. Libraries rely on statistics and performance metrics to demonstrate impact and engagement and to communicate our value. But outside the university, academic libraries have a cultural value that transcends door counts, borrowing statistics and survey data. And it's vital that we reach out to these wider networks to build strong communities who can advocate for us. This is a story about saying yes to opportunities and about using these opportunities to position the library as an investment in the futures of the communities we serve. And that means being flexible about the ways that we communicate, telling the stories that resonate with our audiences, not the ones we think we should or want to tell them. First though, a bit about me. I'm a 34 year old librarian at the University of Melbourne. I've worked here since 2015 first in the Science and Engineering Library, then in the Bailu Library with the Arts team, and now at the Architecture Building and Planning Library. Before becoming a librarian, I studied at the University of Melbourne. I did a Bachelor of Arts with Honours, majoring in Literature and Gender Studies. I went on to do a PhD in Literature about the American New Woman in Literary and Popular Culture between 1890 and 1930. The thesis was interdisciplinary and really showcased my love of all things culture, from books to film, advertising and art, and embraced the social history of this period, particularly looking at representations of gender, race and sexuality. I became an academic librarian because I love the research journey and I wanted to help people navigate their way through that experience. In 2019, I worked with Dr. Derham Groves and the ABP library team to co-curate an exhibition on the Australian architect, Robin Boyd. The exhibition formed part of the Robin Boyd Centenary of Design, a program of events run by the Robin Boyd Foundation that celebrated the 100th anniversary of Boyd's birth. In light of this significant event, Dr. Groves pitched the idea of a radio segment to ABC Radio National. He was accepted and invited me to join him on Miff Warhurst's afternoon show on the 20th of November. I was terrified. Everything inside me screamed no. How could I talk about architecture to a national audience for 20 minutes? I wasn't an expert on Robin Boyd. I was an art student and now a librarian. But with the encouragement and support of my ABP colleague, Naomi Malumbi, I took a leap of faith and said yes. The day rolled around and I was incredibly nervous. You can see in these photos, I'm trying to ground myself by standing tall and placing my hands firmly on the desk. But you know what? It was actually fun. Darren and I have a great jovial dynamic and we were able to bring that gently adversarial vibe to the program. What is ugly is changing all the time. What is pretty, what is beautiful, all of those things constantly evolving. So if that is in fact the case, who do we trust? Don't, when... don't trust architects, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think despite the fact that Derham has put himself out there as very anti-Boyd, they have more in common than he'd probably like to think. <laughs> no! Yes, it's true. Um, because actually what they're both doing is they're, they're controversially coming out saying things that aren't, aren't popular. popular at the time. Um, 
I think it's important actually that you create a space um, to allow people to question the status quo. Um, we've done an exhibition together at the University of Melbourne um, in the Architecture Library called Reframing the Australian Ugliness. And uh, Derham asked his students to think about what they thought that he's asking them to question and critique. And I think it's really important that there is an open and a safe space to continue to do that with the greats of Robin Boyd and, and the greats of Derham Rose. I was on cloud nine afterwards. I didn't go blank like I'd feared I would. And it turned out I knew more about the topic than I realized. I was even confident enough to ask for a photo with Miff. As we left the studio, producer Haley Crane asked if I'd be interested in doing something like this again. Continuing with my just say yes mantra, I agreed and found myself emailing her a list of potential topics that I'd feel comfortable talking about. I figured that was the last I'd hear from her. Yet only two weeks later, I got another email from Haley, this time asking me to come on Myth's show in three days time to talk about summer reading for the upcoming Christmas holidays. Okay, I thought, I know about books, but how on earth am I going to prepare a recommended reading list of six books in time? I prepared all weekend drawing on my recent book club experiences and somehow managed to turn up and talk about books the following Monday. I wasn't sure that this segment had been a success. There was a mix up with the running order and I was forced to rush through my 20 minute segment in 10 minutes. But it mustn't have gone too bad because two weeks later, Haley emailed again, inviting me back to the studios to trial a new segment for the 2020 ABC Radio Melbourne Breakfast Show. The new host for 2020 was comedian and performer, Sammy J. The trial was a success. Sammy is a kind and generous presenter and we quickly developed a good conversational dynamic. The producers wanted to approach the segment as a cultural roundup where I'd take the role of Sammy's cultured friend who would introduce a topic that we could dissect together. Though this wasn't a segment about libraries per se, my title of librarian would be mentioned. Before I knew it, we were booking in my first breakfast radio segment. From Thursday the 23rd of January, I'd be on the radio every second Thursday at 6.15 a.m. My first topic was Dolly Parton. Now, apart from knowing that she was a celebrity who had a couple of hit songs, I knew next to nothing about Dolly. But I did know that I had one week to prepare. So I did what I do best and started researching. Since then, I've presented on topics as diverse as Little Women, James Bond theme songs, Peter Rabbit, binge watching, and most recently, horror films. Now, I'm not going to pretend that this all just happened. In fact, this experience has shown me that all the things I've done in work and in life generally have led up to this moment. One of my skills and weaknesses is my ability to prepare. My 11 years of academic education have honed my research skills. And as a librarian, I know how to effectively use the resources around me. But I know I don't have a good long term memory. I don't remember facts and figures. I need to have researched a topic recently to commit the information to my short term memory. And I need to have that information to hand when I present on it. There are many times when this kind of preparation has paid off. During the Sammy J segment on James Bond theme songs, a talkback caller rang in to discuss her favourite Bond song. You Know My Name from Casino Royale. Now, I hadn't given this song much thought before, but during my research, I discovered some interesting facts about the lyrics of the song. As a result, I was able to integrate this information into the discussion, building on her comments to create a more inclusive space. Uh, good morning, Christy in Canberra. How are you? Oh, no, thanks, Sammy. How are you? Very well, thank you so much. Are you a Bond aficionado? More recent iterations to be honest. I really got into it with Casino Royale and the theme song from that, You Know My Name by Chris Cornell, is an absolute banger. 
Natasha, are you a fan of that, what, that one? I think so. I actually think that's a great call. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily my favourite style of music, but I think what the, the music there does, um, it really deals with those existential dilemmas that Bond was facing. So what are the sacrifices of a secret agent? Does he have to have cold blood running through his veins in order to do what he has to do? Um, it also really foreshadows what's going to happen in the film as well. So there's a line in there, life has gone with just the spin of a wheel. And if you've seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Other times, however, my excessive researching has not helped things. A couple of weeks ago, I presented from home for the first time, no longer able to come into the studio due to the COVID-19 situation. I had difficulty connecting to the studio and still hadn't connected only moments before going on air. I was super stressed and also worried about waking my housemate who was asleep in the next room. As a result, I completely fell back on my notes. I forgot how to project my voice with clarity and confidence and instead clung to the script that I'd written. I was really disappointed with this segment, but I also knew I had the ability to improve my performance. Years of working in the library, delivering classes to hundreds of students and doing presentation training run by experts had given me the tools to know how to fix what had gone wrong. Simple tricks like standing tall and opening up my chest to project confidence and smiling as I spoke to bring warmth to my tone could be quickly implemented. I also reminded myself I didn't have to be perfect. I could be playful and have fun with the topic rather than presenting as a stern academic expert. But one of the best things I've done is to draw on my networks. My friends and family have provided untold emotional support. These are the people who know me best. They know my skill set and my own personal challenges, and they provide advice from a place of insight and compassion. Library colleagues are my go to for brainstorming potential radio topics and discussion points. They are always a touch point for any relevant library issues that I need to know about, so I'm not caught off guard. But probably the single most important person supporting me through this all has been my brother. This is Jeremy. He's a Walkley Award winning journalist currently working as a digital journalist with the ABC investigations team. He also worked as a reporter and producer at Radio National and ABC Rural in WA and in Southeast Victoria. And he was part of the team behind the award winning Trace podcast. So Jeremy really knows radio and he really knows the ABC. Unsurprisingly, he was the first person I called when I got the gig. One of the first things I asked him was, how do I communicate to this audience? I had experience with academic writing and workplace reporting. I'd presented at conferences and knew how to teach classes to university students. But I understood this was different. Here I'd be speaking to the public. This was not a specialised group of academics knowledgeable about and interested in my topic or internal university stakeholders who employed the same language of in-house acronyms. And it wasn't even a larger group like the student cohort who were receiving specialised instruction that was relevant to their education. The people listening to the radio were a broader, more diverse audience. Jeremy's first piece of advice was, think about things from the perspective of your audience. This sounds obvious, but it absolutely changes the way that you present. I quickly learned that you can't assume that people listening will care about your topic. I might think that what I'm talking about is the most interesting thing in the world, but if I can't find a way to make it relevant to say someone in WA, then listeners just won't care. So when I was preparing for my first radio gig on Robin Boyd, Jeremy asked me to think about how I could tell this story so it was relevant to listeners nationally. What was the bigger picture? I realised that it wasn't enough to say that Robin Boyd was a famous Australian architect who wrote a popular book. 
What was interesting was that the moment in which he was writing and the way that he challenged existing Australian culture. The Australian Ugliness is the book that a lot of people would be familiar with. Can you explain what he was on about, Natasha? Well, he's really interesting, not just for his architectural contributions, because he was writing at this incredible time, as you said, it was poised, Australia was poised, this mid-century point where Australians were still referring to themselves as British, and yet American culture was sweeping the world. We just had TV that had arrived. And yet Robin Boyd came out and he made these big statements. He said, we had a secondhand kind of culture. We didn't know who we are as a people. Um, we were actually an arch artistic and intellectual desert is what he said. Um, he called attention to the cultural cringe, which we still talk about today. And it was really controversial because um, Australians probably didn't want this being called out at the time. Um, but he was asking us to think about who we are, think about what is our country, what is our environment and what is our setting and who should we be going into the future. And that's why I think that his book, The Australian Ugliness, continues to resonate. This is one of the biggest things I've learned through this whole experience. You've got to adapt to the context in which you're communicating. On radio, that means you've got to find a way to tell a story. Asking questions like, why is that important? And why does that matter? Can give you the framework for your discussion. Every time I go to do my Sammy J segment, I try to prepare a section that sets the scene for the listeners and explains the bigger picture around the topic. For our discussion about Little Women, I situated our analysis of the book and movie within the Me Too movement. I used this to explain the ways that feminism had gone mainstream and therefore why this text is still relevant today. This provided contemporary relevance and a hook to get people interested. Another key piece of advice that Jeremy gave me was the importance of explaining terms. You shouldn't assume that your audience knows what you're talking about, that a person, an event, an acronym, or any piece of information is self-evident. For the segment on summer reading, I talked about my book club and how we were trying to diversify our reading by choosing non-anglocentric books. I knew that it was important to explain the term anglocentric, but I had to find a way to do it that didn't talk down to the listeners. Here's what I went with. I'm part of a book club, as you mentioned, um, and we had been doing a regular book club thing where we were choosing a book, we'd all read it, move on, do another one next time. Mm. Uh, then we stepped back and we thought, like, what are we actually reading? And we realised that pretty much most of what we read is anglocentric. So anything that was published in Australia, the UK, US, New Zealand, Canada, so English speaking countries. Um, and we thought, maybe we need to broaden our horizons a bit it's also useful to include enough contextual information so listeners can follow along even if they don't know much about the topic. Rather than just saying little women and expecting people to know what I'm talking about, it was better to say Little Women, the 1868 novel by American writer Louisa May Alcott. These subtle changes really help to make the conversation inclusive. Inclusivity is also achieved by changing the role that you adopt as a presenter. Although you might be the expert on a particular topic, you don't have to present in that way. I found it's much more effective to adopt the role of a friend, as if I'm having a friendly conversation with the host and the listeners. Finally, one of my favourite tricks of the trade has been using memorable lines and catchphrases to attract people's attention. In the Dolly Parton episode, I tried this. I consider myself Dolly positive. And I also tried this. I like to consider her a bit of a feminist and a political Trojan horse. I figure that most people are listening to the radio with only one ear. Maybe they're driving or doing the dishes or going for a run. So if I can pique their interest with something snappy and kind of silly, then great. In the summer reading segment, I tried to come up with some one-liners about the books that I've recommended. Testaments by Margaret Atwood, why? 
this is just the hot book of the moment. And speaking about Trent Dalton's novel, Boy Swallows Universe, I tried this hot take. It's just completely and recognisably Australian. This is just one of the techniques I'm learning to use to communicate in this space. You might be thinking, why do I need to know how to present on the radio? What's this got to do with libraries? It's true, very little of these segments are directly about libraries. Sometimes Sammy will ask a left of field question about them, like this interesting exchange earlier in the year. What's university libraries like these days? Are they just empty? Oh gosh, no, no, they're absolutely full. People are fighting for space. Because um, of the Wi-Fi? Or... No, no, they love a quiet place to study, love to be surrounded by books, and we've got all the good things. All the good things, yeah, but they're really just asleep. I used to do a lot of sleeping in my library. We try not to encourage sleeping. You mean you poke them when they're asleep? <laughs> we try to encourage them back to their study. Most of the time, though, I'm there to talk about culture, not libraries. But I've come to realise this doesn't actually matter. Libraries have an inherent cultural value in the community. Contingent valuation studies have consistently shown that people value libraries very highly. Because I'm presented as a librarian on the show, my very presence reinforces the positive association that already exists. As long as I'm friendly, open, intelligent and curious, our discussions about culture build on that positive association. They reinforce the connection between the library and the community. Part of this involves letting go of official narratives around libraries and the universities that we're a part of. It's about telling the stories that resonate with our audiences, not the ones that we think we should or want to tell them. But in doing so, libraries benefit enormously. Every fortnight, listeners are reminded about the University of Melbourne Library, and that connection is strengthened. Building that connection is a way of building strong communities who can advocate for us. Letting go of official narratives is also important when faced with curly questions. Radio land is unpredictable, and there were many times when Sammy asked an off-topic question without notice. In my very first segment, he asked me this. Hey, Natasha, did you have a school formal? Uh, yes, we did. Yeah? Did you enjoy the night? Oh, of course. You're looking at me like I know something about yeah, this. Your, no, I know nothing. Getting <laughs> <You're>, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, because Melbourne Girls College has scrapped their Year 12 formal this year. They've decided it's causing too many uh, distractions. That and... was my high school. Oh! oh. <laughs> I, listeners, I, this is not collusion. I had no idea. Wow, okay, so well, let's go straight to the source. Was it just a, was it a riotous debauch night of drugs really and illicit? Wasn't. I promise. I know you won't believe me, but I promise it was perfectly fine. They're claiming that it's just becoming such a distraction and indeed actually, uh, well, there's a socioeconomic element to it because, uh, you know, it's the amount of pressure being placed on, on the families to spend money. Oh, on, it's a on, huge, huge output. Yep. Yeah. Um, but you would prefer the night to remain? I'm just trying to get a headline out of you. Ooh. Dr. Natasha Story slams I, Alma Mater. I'm going to do a Dolly Parton and deflect, deflect. Oh, <laughs> damn you. I was completely blindsided. You can hear in that long, um, I'm trying to figure out where he's going with this. I was so thrown. I could barely remember if this was my school or even if I'd had a formal. But once I regained my composure, I decided to have fun with the question and make light of the situation. However, as soon as Sammy started trying to get a headline out of me, I realised I could run into trouble with the wrong answer. So I decided to deflect. Now, deflecting is a perfectly legitimate strategy, but you want to do it in a way that doesn't feel defensive or oppositional. In this case, I deflected by referring back to our earlier conversation about Dolly Parton's politics. This allowed me to get away with a non-answer, but it was done in a way that was friendly and light-hearted. The politician's non-answer is particularly important when you're faced with politically sensitive topics. Academic librarians work within the priorities of both their library and institution, 
And navigating these priorities is critical when you're presenting to the public. During my Little Women segment, I was asked about the COVID-19 situation. Now, this was the 6th of February, so it was early days. We were still calling COVID coronavirus, and the focus was mainly on international students in China who were unable to travel to Australia for semester one. I have to ask you, working in a library at a university right now, um, has the coronavirus, to switch gears briefly, uh, has that taken over your life a little bit as far as admin and organisation goes? Well, look, it's something that we've absolutely got to be um, aware of and it's just um, obviously a really tricky situation. So um, our hearts go out to people who are stuck uh, in China. Um, yeah, because semester is about to start, orientation is starting up in a couple of weeks and obviously we want everybody here. Has Melbourne been pushback semester dates or anything like that? I don't know. I'm, I'm not certain at this stage, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, it's obviously quickly evolving. I knew it wasn't my role to give a statement about this situation. I'm acutely aware of the way that universities operate. They're hierarchical and rely on top-down decision-making and centralised messaging. But I couldn't just refuse to answer the question. I decided instead to follow Ronan Keating's sage advice. You say it best when you say nothing at all. While I couldn't comment on Melbourne Uni's official response, I could be genuine and express care and concern for the people caught up in the situation. Parroting official messaging would have been wrong, but it also would have made for bad radio. I'm not on the show as an official spokesperson for Melbourne Uni. I'm there as Sammy's cultured friend. So the most appropriate response was to be friendly and sympathetic. Look, again, you may not find yourself in this exact situation, fending off questions about a worldwide pandemic but the principles of effective communication are just as useful here as in any situation. When you leverage the cultural value of libraries, it frees you up to respond to questions. You can be playful and lighthearted. You can bring a well-researched perspective, but you can also deflect when appropriate. By adapting to your context, you reinforce the positive association with libraries. Obviously, I couldn't have done this without the support of the people I work with. I want to thank the University of Melbourne Library Executive for allowing me to pursue these opportunities. They supported me from the very beginning and gave me the green light to try something different. Academic libraries are facing global library challenges, even before COVID-19 arrived. We're often so busy responding to internal pressures that we don't have the opportunity to look beyond our institutions. But hopefully I've shown the value of doing things like this. Reaching out to wider networks can bring real rewards. We can build strong communities who can advocate for us if we're willing to adapt to these different contexts. As I've found, we don't have to talk about libraries to shine a light on them. Thank you so much, Natasha, for this very inspiring presentation. We've got a few questions for you that's come in through um, your presentation. Wonderful. Beautiful. The first one is, researching of the topic seems to be a big time investment. When do you stop? There is a lot of information on Dolly Parton out there. Yep, that is a great question and something that I'm still working on, shall we say. Um, for that Dolly Parton uh, episode, um, yeah, I spent time, like my own personal time, um, I listened to the podcast because the focus was on the Dolly Parton um, podcast that's been going around. So I, I slammed that in a, a, a couple of days. I watched um, a documentary about her. I watched the movie Nine to Five um, and I was taking notes through all this and I was chatting to my friends and chatting to people and writing down notes as I was going. Um, and then I had to write it up in some sort of coherent manner. So, I mean, that was definitely a learning curve and I'm still trying to contain the amount of time um, that this really takes. Um, it's hard. Um, my brother does breakfast radio, um, sorry, breakfast TV. So he's on um, 
yeah, the ABC Brecky TV. And he often has to get up super, super early in the morning and spend like 20 minutes familiarizing himself with what's happening in the news and then go and speak about it. So I try and keep that in mind, like as a comparison that he gets, you know, 20 minutes uh, before going on TV and I, I can always try and improve, but yeah, it's a really fair point. Great. Um, has ABC provided you with any training or have you worked these techniques at all by yourself? Um, no, they have not provided me with any training. Um, from the very beginning, um, I was once once I was asked back, and particularly once I was um, invited to go on Sammy's show, I I wrote to them and asked for any feedback that they could give me. But um, to be honest, they don't have time to do that. Like I'm a short segment on a show that happens every weekday and they've got multiple guests like they don't have time to be coaching me through how to do this i think what really happened was i like surprised myself and performed well the very first time when i went on Miff's show um to talk about robin boyd and they just go right yep that's talent as they like to say um and let's just go with her and then they just trust you to do it so any, any improvement I've had to pursue myself. So as I said, Jeremy's been so important because he, he really talks about that audience perspective and how, how you tell the story. So I know how to research, but I need to translate the, the million threads of, that I could follow into something really focused and coherent. Um, but in terms of then um, the presenting, um, yeah, I've just tried to, like, I always listen back to it on the day that I do it. Um, I'm pretty harsh on myself, so I can hear if I don't, yeah, if I don't project properly or if there are a lot of ums and ahs. Like, one of the things I didn't talk about in the presentation was I have a lot of um, ticks that I use uh, to save space when I'm talking on radio. So I say things like, absolutely amazing, um, and, and similar words like that, um, and they buy me time. Um, but yeah, just, I, I, I'm not afraid to kind of take a step back and kind of put on this presenter vibe and, and kind of do a pretend version of me. Like even this presentation is a pretend version of me. My colleagues know that I'm not like this all the time. I'm pretty silly and um, yeah, can have fun with things. But yeah, like I, I am also, I'm not, I don't have that radio voice all the time. So yeah, you've got to work at it. Beautiful. Um, what's the next one? Have you been, sorry, how did you navigate breaking away from the standard university narrative? Yeah, that's really hard. Um, I think that where I was talking about how, what my role was um, with the COVID response, I think that's, probably was a guiding experience for me. So you've got to know in what capacity you're, you're appearing in that space. And I, as he's asking me the question, I'm sitting back and I'm, see, I'm seeing a series of red flags coming towards me. I'm seeing worldwide pandemic. Well, it wasn't quite at that stage, but um, you know, incredibly difficult situation and, and that is being managed centrally. So, I'm thinking to myself, I can't talk about this. I can't talk about this. So I'm thinking, what can I say that is saying something but not actually parroting the official line? And as I said before, that sort of um, compassionate approach is the way. Um, like if you're invited into a space to represent your institution very specifically, to be the spokesperson about a specific issue, um, then that's when it would be appropriate to to draw on um, official university narratives or even official library narratives as well. But I'm there to talk about culture. Um, he's just he just tries to throw a throw a weird question at me pretty much every week. Um, so <laughs> I just get used to that, and I kind of spend my time playfully batting them away. <laughs> I suppose that's part of the radio show, isn't it? Yeah, and the best thing is like you've got to the the trying not to be defensive is the best thing you can do. Um, so 
if you're internally freaking out, which, you know, most of the time I am, I'm trying not to, um, you've, you've got to not allow that to be in your response, both in your voice and also in the words that you say. So don't be like, oh, I just there's no way I can talk about that. Oh, I, you know, only this person could, or it's really inappropriate that you ask me that, you know, that, that actually puts yourself at a distance from listeners. Um, you know, you end up this kind of, yeah, I, I don't know, bad vibes. And you really don't want to bring that kind of um, feeling uh, to that kind of conversation. So even if it is serious, um, downplaying it and, um, but, but with kind of, yeah, sympathy and empathy is really good. Yeah, that's great advice. Have you had to rewrite your own job description? <laughs> um, <laughs> at this stage, I'd say that um, I've like, one of, one of the reasons why I've been supported to do this is because I believe that I've got the trust of um, my managers and the library executives. So, they they understand that I can do my job um, and for me like assuring them that this wouldn't impact on my ability to do that kind of core business was the most important thing like it's it's not fair to ask them for, for this unknown space um, you know l let me take up this chunk of every day doing that um, I don't think that's that's fair um, so about assuring them and turning up every day, doing all the core bits of my job, but finding a way to integrate that into um, my my day to day. And yes, I said, as I said before, like I, I do a lot of this outside of work hours. Um, I have been able to, for example, um, if I'm doing a, a library desk shift, um, if I don't have a patron with me at the time, I might do a little bit of research about the topic and take my notes online um, and then I can go back to them later. So just ensuring you meet kind of all those requirements, I think is, is important. Yeah, definitely. Has your radio experience given you any ideas for your library work? Like, have you been able to combine the two? Um, I I think I'm being asked, um, and this is in, in the work still, to uh, do be involved in a presentation um, that kind of draws on this um, around kind of presenting your research. Um, and so really, I think, I hope this presentation has shown that it, this is so much more about effective communication in different spaces. So it, it doesn't matter yeah, that I, my experience was radio. The ideas behind adapting to your context are relevant, um, to, like depending on whatever you're pursuing. So um, I think those kind of opportunities will continue to come uh, as a result of this. Um, outside of that, I was actually, before, before we were put into lockdown, I was invited to, uh, to go on a podcast, um, like a, a public podcast, um, to because the, this person, this producer had heard me speak. Um, and so it's kind of broadening my role in a way because I'm kind of reaching out in a public space I hadn't anticipated. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess the exciting thing is you just don't know where it's gonna take you. So yeah, I'm, I'm really keen <laughs> to see anybody's ideas that they've got. Yeah, for sure. Um, how do you think your your work with the radio can apply to us as librarians presenting and teaching at the universities? Um, I think, yeah, going back to those um, generalizable kind of um, principles of who are your audience? Um, literally, what are they, what are they there to experience from you? So have that being um, the first kind of principle, like, don't come with a set of, I need to tell somebody something. Um, think about who are these people? Why have they turned up? What are, they, what are they gonna get out of this? And how are they going to receive this in the best possible way? And I think I'd say like librarians do that all the time in teaching, um, but it is just a useful thing to go back to. Um, and then I think those presenter techniques, so understanding your voice and the projection. So I, I hope that it came across when I stood up 
tall and open my chest. And as soon as you smile, let me tell you, as soon as you smile, your tone of your voice changes. Um, it's, it's really a really good technique. And I was even told, um, for example, that to put a picture up of Sammy J in my study here where I'm presenting um, so that I automatically do that because you tend to do that. <laughs> but, you know, like little techniques that you can employ. Obviously, you're probably not going to put up a face in, in the room that you're presenting in. But, um, yeah, those kind of um, bodily things that you can do and adapt and, yeah, principles of how you actually speak to people and how you communicate that information that you need to get across. Have you got any suggestions for people to, where they can look for information on presentation te techniques? Is there anything in particular that you have drawn on or resources that you have used? I would probably have to follow up on that one. I haven't gone to like specific um, websites or resources. Um, as I said, Jeremy was the first person I spoke to. He's just great. Like he can off the cuff um, basically give you a pep talk on how to do this. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and if you're like nutting out a, a topic, like, you know, he'll, he'll kind of help you tease it out. Um, so for this stage, it's, it's been him and it's also been, oh, with the topic thing as well. I, I do sometimes speak to the ABC, um, producers as well so they they have a good idea of what's what's the relevant story so i'm not always required to come up with the big issue we can sometimes work it out together yeah great someone has commented saying i take it you're identified as working for the university of melbourne at the beginning of each segment um did you have to receive permission from the university to have this public affiliation um, I had to receive um, permission from the library executive, so University of Melbourne library executive. I'm not sure if they, because I wasn't privy to these discussions, whether they reached out to senior University of Melbourne people, but obviously it's completely normalised for people working in the university to present publicly and there's like a... Um, like a public relations um, team. I think somebody from there started following me on Twitter after I started doing this on the radio. Uh, so I'm not sure if, if they actually spoke to them, if the library executive spoke to them, but um, certainly I had to go up as up to the university librarian level um, to have this approved. Great. I think that was all the questions. Oh, no, one more come in. No, that was just a comment. You got some really great feedback coming in that everyone's very impressed by your talent. Oh, thanks everybody. <laughs> I was I was still nervous for this presentation. Um, I, I just do the fake it till you make it approach. <laughs> you just go for it. <laughs> I think you're doing that very well. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for your questions.